Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome, friends, to episode 48 of the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. I'm Matt. I'm back here with Kurt and Jerry today. And uh, today is, I think, going to be an interesting podcast. I've got a thought experiment for us to think about based on uh, some recent books that I've been reading about the future of neurobiology. And so I I was going to title this uh, Trauma and Nanobots, and then I realized that nobody would probably... uh, listen to a podcast that contained the words trauma and nanobot in it. Um, so I went with the title, A Future Without Traumatic Memories, A Thought Experiment. I, I thought that would uh, maybe get more people to click and listen to this episode. So uh, we, we've got to, we're going to take a, a little bit of a look into the future of neurobiology, uh, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about nanobots at the same time. So um As always, we start out with our bright, shiny objects of the week, and uh, I'll start this week uh, with Jerry. Jerry, what are you thinking about this week? You know, I I had an experience watching Tiger Woods yesterday um, come in second place in um, a tournament and and really play well, but he just not well enough, and he ended up losing it. And he came to the podium and and talked about how grateful he is after a year ago, not even knowing he'd ever golf again to be in this position. And I was thinking about post-traumatic growth and thinking about how if you would have asked him several years ago, would you have been grateful to come in second place in a tournament? He probably would have had a very different experience about that, talk about how he just didn't perform or how he lost and how, right? And so it it made me think about um, really how we help people shift um, from focusing on what they've lost to how to be in the moment and appreciate the moment to kind of do it. So, um, I I think because yesterday I I spent the day kind of thinking about the things I would be grateful for um, in my own life. So um, as I watched Tiger kind of accept that um, position and also accept his new um, limitations and and possibilities, uh, it was helpful to me to kind of reflect on my own life. So um, I'm going to uh, recognize Tiger for coming in second place yesterday. Wow. Hey, Jeff, for, I thought you if you're listening. Uh, you, you, you're famous now. You're famous. <laughs> Kurt, what about you? What are you thinking about this week? Well, I caught a portion of that, too. It, it was really fun to watch. It was, it, it was, a, it was a good tournament. I started uh, watching one of my favorite series, which is related to football. I love football season. And uh, there's a new season of the show um, Hard Knocks coming out, right? That's the HBO produced show and uh they show these athlete speeches which i'm always kind of like okay fine (laughs) i've heard another athlete speech all over again but this guy said something really cool that i liked and he gave a speech to the whole team about finding their why and so that was a really kind of uh it was a good one for me that i started doing actually after i watched that i was like i'm gonna spend like the next month finding kind of re re and re-engaging with the why i do what i do and I thought that was a, a good exercise to go through. And that would take some time. I could, wouldn't be a one time I'm going to sit down and think about it. I'm going to do it repeatedly over the next 30 days and keep thinking of writing a, a big list of, of the whys. And uh, that, was a, that, was, that was my bright, shiny one for the week. Very good. Good reminder to our audience. Uh, a big part of my self-care as well. And, and I believe that what was their why to win two games this year? I believe it's the Cleveland <laughs> Browns, right? It might be. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's a study in what? Like, at the, and I, I know we have some fans in Cleveland. You know I love you. You've won some championships. But wow, like, 
let's do the Cleveland Browns because th- that, that's a study of winning. But good luck to the Browns this year. We're, the, we're, we'll root for you. Uh, so mine, uh, we, we've got a topic looking into the future. So um, I'll, I'll do mine of, of kind of looking into something that's more traditional. And, and that's uh, the, the concept of chi or ki. Uh, ki, I believe I'm probably mispronouncing the Japanese version of it. Chi, I'm probably getting the Chinese version halfway right. And I've been studying a few. I've been practicing Tai Chi now for about a year, probably poorly, but I've been been trying to build. uh, I can do the whole 40 sets, even though probably 39 um, are wrong. There's this move called punch in the crotch, which I think I'm a master of. Um, But other than that, I'm sure I'm screwing up. Personal information. I know, but I've got this punch to the crotch. Like, it's the easiest move because you just can – I got the punch in the crotch right, but everything else probably not. Uh, and, and But it, it's really interesting to see how I just got a, a letter from my insurer and now uh, acupuncture is a, a something that they'll cover under insurance. And I just think that it's interesting that this, this traditional sort of uh, uh, knowledge is, is coming back um, into a way that's a best practice enough where uh, – healthcare is actually covering it. And uh, I know my personal experience with Tai Chi has been really pretty cool. So uh, I'm trying to do, I'm not ready to tell the audience yet about my, my newest uh, dives into Chi, but uh, uh, stay tuned. And uh, when I feel confident enough to say what I'm doing, I'll, I'll share that with everybody. So a little cliffhanger there if you wonder what I'm into right now. But uh, so let's get into today's topic. Uh, and so here's what I've been seeing, and I'll, I'll give credit to the two books that, that I've been reading. One's The Biological Mind. I mentioned that before by Alan Janif. And the other one is Know This, and it's um, edited by John Brockman. And we'll put those up on the show notes as well, traumainformlens.org. And both of these are, are kind of futuristic books. Um, Biological Mind talks a lot about where our technology is around brain scans and all that. But there seems to be, and I would put this at best 10 years out, if not maybe 20 years out into the future. This isn't something that's going to come online, I would doubt, in kind of the next five to six years. But it it seems to be coming down uh, the pipe is that we've talked about on this show that a lot of times traumatic memories can kind of keep us in this cycle of re-traumatization as long as we sort of haven't... uh, kind of uh, dealt with those and and released those through EMDR or other sort of processes. And what I'm reading with these kind of futuristic books and where where the technology is going, that it seems like that, and again, this is is hypothetical kind of science fiction, but but they see where the technology is going, is that you could put somebody with, with PTSD trauma in a brain scanner of the future and you could have them recall that traumatic memory and then through probably a chemical or i like the little nanobots they're my favorite they're they're these really tiny robots that can go into the brain they're small enough to go through that barrier and potentially eliminate or take the power away from that traumatic memory um and again i could try to explain the silent science poorly for the next hour which i don't think is the our point here but, but it started to get me thinking about what if we could just eliminate traumatic memories? <laughs> and what would that mean for psychology? What would that mean for education? Because on one hand, I think that that, that would just be a great thing is, hey, you got PTSD because you were deployed and, and you have all these memories and we can erase those memories. But when you start to think about that a little deeper, I think it gets a little tricky. And I love the smile on Jerry's face now. So Jerry, I wonder, I I know you read some of the books that I read. What what do you think, as some of maybe the positive, (laughs) negative um, kind of consequences of, of where we could be going as far as science around the elimination or at least the lessening of of traumatic memory and some of the larger consequences for that? Well, the first thing I have to kind of do is get myself in my futuristic mind, right? So whenever we 
look at the future. We have to look at it from our present mind and not uh, to do it. I thought you were going to put your tinfoil hat on. Yeah, well, me and, and uh, what was it? Uh, the uh, Brown and Back to the Future. It's like, uh, let's yeah. stop go, right? So I'll kind of frizz out my hair a little. <laughs> but um, you raise some important issues. And, and um, one of those is the concept of trauma and developmental trauma versus PTSD, mm -hmm. in that in PTSD, there's identified memory, and that identified memory is associated with some type of event, so that we actually begin to become conditioned to um, the re-exposure to that memory. But what if your trauma isn't a specific memory, but a lifetime of exposure to unpredictable random, mm -hmm. then my memory isn't something that's conditioned into my amygdala, but actually has recalibrated my entire nervous system. Yeah. So how would we then go in and say, we're going to recalibrate your entire nervous system as opposed to just removing one memory? So I think in one case, we're talking about a pretty um, a distinguishing, say I was in a car accident, I was fairly healthy and I was exposed to a car accident, and now I had this memory. Mm -hmm. And could they remove that memory? Versus somebody who's had chronic developmental traumas to kind of look at that. That's the first thing that popped into my mind. The second thing that popped into my mind is that Really, if somebody can remove memory, can they install memories? And that's pretty scary, right? And so- Total recall Mars, though, you can go to Mars. You know, everything that we as humans create, there's potential good and potential evil. And so we're really creating dilemmas for ourselves as you begin to talk about this piece. So I think that um, when we manipulate memory, and then the last thing I began to think about is I began to think about my father-in-law who had Alzheimer's disease, who lost memories, but he wasn't the same person anymore. And so how much are we in some ways made up of the narrative memories, autobiographical memories that we have? And if we change one of those and we're in a system, what impact does that have on my entire makeup? And that because the brain is self-organizing, is that one change could have, small change could have, what is a magnitude greater change on my larger biology? So I think that when we have this discussion, although it's nice to have this futuristic discussion, I think it's important to um, way, what is the responsibility that we have when we make decisions about our future is, is the things we're creating actually good for us, mm -hmm. right? And so much of what we do, we don't sit down and decide. We don't just sit down and decide when they come out with a new technology, whether it's really good for us to have that, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, what is the impact on us as a species as we continue to create these new uh, visions? Some positive, definitely, but also some real negatives involved in that. So that's yeah. my thoughts about these things. Kurt, what are some of your initial thoughts? Jerry gave us a lot to chew on there. Well, one thing you said, Jerry, is, is about creating dilemmas, which is part of the, the dilemma of even change or recovery from trauma right? that even going towards a, a brighter future means you're giving up something and something that was comfortable at at some point in time right there's some way of dealing with the world that you get used to and becomes habitual and creating new pathways means it that, that goes away like that you, that may be a loss so there's a feeling of of kind of loss that comes along with any kind of any kind of change I also was thinking about one of the things I heard from uh, a, a great professor that I had in graduate school. He used to talk about how 
how to kind of conceptualize the behavioral view on the individual and that it was the nexus of all the variables that affected behavior in any given moment in time, right? So there was previous learning history, there was uh, genetic endowment, there was biological characteristics, and then there was the current environment. And if you could somehow understand all of those things and each one of their component contributions, you could understand the whole thing. And certainly being able to then alter previous experience, I would really change the way we even conceptualized our, our sense of what a person is and who, a, who an individual is, which would be kind of scary, like more than, more than a little scary, that'd be really kind of scary. Well, and I, I think that that is, as I was learning about uh, the possibilities of, again, all, all this is kind of, I, I think at least 10 years out, but probably more like 20 years out of these possibilities. Again, you think about a world where people don't sort of have to suffer from the negative consequences that, that we talk about a lot on this show. Uh, seems like a utopian in some ways. It's like, oh, you, you had that, like Jerry said, a car wreck, or you ha had a bad experience with a deployment or, or suffered some abuse. Um, you know, that that would just be a good thing, is we could break these traps, these cycles, the negative mental health impacts. The other thought I had, too, and I, I think I'll, you know, without disclosing a whole lot of my own personal experience with trauma in my childhood, is that I don't know who I would be, and this kind of speaks to Kurt, who I would be today if I didn't have to overcome the, what that challenge made me face. Um, for the good and the bad, I'm not saying there were, there was all like rosy. There were a lot of bad years that I struggled with a lot of stuff. But at the same time, I know I, who I am today has so much to do with the fact that I overcame that in my past experience. And I think it, it kind of leads to what Kurt was saying is, who would Matt be without having to go through that? And that's the whole thing as I wonder, and the, again, that was, since we're in the future, I'll just throw out a wonder kind of statement here is, you know, do, if we eliminated traumatic memories, do we weaken ourselves as, as human beings in some way? And knowing that trauma can paralyze people at the same time. So, so I, I say that with, with kind of this, you know, half ghoul feeling is, God, I wouldn't wish trauma on anybody. I'm not doing that. But if we just eliminate traumatic memories without sort of maybe a process in some ways involved, um, are, are we less resilient? Are, are you know, uh, I don't know. It, it just made me really think about, hey, if somebody could just zap that out of my mind at, you know, age 13, would I have been better off for that or worse off? And I, I thought that was an interesting thought to pop into my head as, you know, I was kind of processing what this would mean for both mental health and my own life as well. Well, you know, while you were talking about one of the kind of questions that pops up into my head that um, when you think about making changes and, and making improvements um, or becoming more healthy or a variety of different changes, they almost all require some kind of, I like to call it friction. Mm -hmm. Some kind of, I used to talk about this when we started to talk about the window of tolerance, right? that you have bounds on how far your stress response can go and where where's your optimal level of functioning. And that one of the ways to really improve, say, physical condition is to get to the edges of your window of tolerance and then have the ability to recover. And I think that that concept can also apply to uh, experiencing challenging situations, which we would call stress, not necessarily trauma. Yeah. But stress isn't necessarily always bad. There's an aspect of it that helps to organize our bodies and helps us to organize effort and going through that develops strength in a lot of different levels at a muscular level, at a cardiovascular level. Um, and I think too, at a, at a mental level. So that gets us into some ideas of resilience and how do you build resilience? And one of the ways is a critical ingredient to building resilience is some kind of challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and overcoming that is really kind of formative to a human being. Um, so I, you bring up some of those questions when you talk about who would I be? Yeah. And, and how, would I, how would I have become the person who I am uh, without some challenge that I had to go through, which is different than trauma. 
uh, there's a difference between trauma and having to go through challenging situations. And that's one that can be well, often difficult to kind of keep in our, in our memories as we talk so much about trauma and start to think about it as, as just stress in general. Yeah. Uh, any kind of stress is bad, but that's not necessarily true. We need some, some levels of stress in, in order for us to grow and develop. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the internet, absolutely. And the flip side of me is if you probably would ask me the question at, you know, maybe 13 is, hey, we could erase this from your mind. I probably would have said, heck yes. <laughs> as quickly as you could hook me up to whatever magical nanobot machine you got, let's get this out so I don't have to deal with it anymore. I think, you know, that it's that other tricky part about us, especially, you know, when we talk about the developmental trauma piece is, you know, all, the, all that hardship of, of, it becomes, again, those challenges of who we are. And yet, boy, there was a lot of pain associated before I was able to sort of experience any post-traumatic growth fr from it as well. And it just makes me, again, consider my own experiences in a different way. Uh, too. Um, and Jerry, I wonder, I wonder if what, what maybe you see about, I mean, uh, you know, I think about the kids we worked with at Denver Children's Home and, you know, so, so many people with really complex trauma. Would there, you know, I think there would be a benefit for a 13 year old Matt who was dealing with this. And I wonder if, if just again, thinking and, and dreaming about a future state that doesn't exist, could, could there be real benefits for people, especially that are maybe struggling with, you know, real complex, intense trauma that's played out uh, over most of their life? Well, let me step back a second and share some of my associations with all of you, right? So one association I, I'm having is, is that part of trauma is the elimination of memories, right? Is that through dissociation, many of our clients really have no recall of what happened to them. They've disconnected that, right? And that in one way that protects them and another way that interferes with them becoming integrated and whole and they tend to avoid situations. So the alterations of memories is occurring naturally. Mm -hmm. The second thing that happens is whenever we bring up a memory, we alter that memory. And so this discussion about talking about or going in and actually messing around with memories is really the process of treatment, mm -hmm. right? Is that that's the process of treatment. And I, and I think that we always run these kinds of um, challenges is that medication speeds up the process of feeling better. Mm -hmm. And for some, it allows them then to access the benefit of the relationship that actually ends up helping and to doing. Medication sometimes interferes with the person's ability to actually process their trauma and becomes in the long run, not a positive intervention. And so as we think about these new and creative that kind of create anxiety and create ethical dilemmas for us, like creating Frankensteins, um, remembering is this probably a time and a place that this could be positive. And this time and a place where this very thing, if it was used, could interfere with somebody's own natural healing process that allows them to overcome and benefit from as Kurt said, are these experiences. So we have to always be challenging ourselves to one, be open to new ways of helping people feel better, but also understanding that sometimes the way we feel better interferes with our own biology. And that's really the, I think, the tension that I'm feeling as we talk about this is yes, of course, if I can go in and make somebody feel better so that they can begin to benefit from life and interact in a different way and have different feedback and to do, right, as opposed to being in their house and being scared to go out, then I might say, well, you know what? An intervention that might be able to disrupt those memories and give you this great thing. But 
then I go, you know what? I kind of woke up today and I, I just remembered I had a bad day yesterday. Could you go in and change my memory so I feel better today? Right, the same process may in fact be a really negative thing for our human species. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think we've got to be open to exploring what possibilities are and then really think through when is, when is the cost benefit say that that might be a good thing and when is it we really need to have some control and power. So there's nothing, you know, this whole idea that we created guns because we wanted to feel safe. Well, where is the limit to that, right? If I want to walk around with a nuclear weapon, do I have, the, does my second amendment right give me the right to do that? Everything has limitations. And yet there's also positive things that we wouldn't have survived as a species being weak if we didn't create that. So when we get polarized on this is a really good thing or a really bad thing, um, most things in our lives are not that simple. Yeah. And I, th I think, you know, when, when we look at this, again, it seems like a good thing until you think about it for a second, then it can be almost a scary thing. Kurt, as Jerry's talking, I, I, I something popped in as, as I always, I'll never run out of questions to ask you as my behavioral expert on the podcast. Um, how, when you think about traumatic memories, and we know that a lot of people, their healing process, and we have like EMDR and other things now, how, how do um, traumatic memories and re-traumatization sort of fit into your, your trauma-informed approach to your training as, as a behavioralist? When we talk about traumatic memories, where does that sort of fit um, in your thinking, I know you have a little bit of a military background as well, not a little bit, you have a military background as well. So, you know, PTSD in that environment has been such a, a huge and important issue as well. So I just kind of wonder from your, your expertise standpoint, where does, where does traumatic memories kind of play into your thinking? It, I like to divide it into the kind of concepts of explicit and implicit memory. Mm -hmm. that there's a part of memory that is what we can talk about. And then, of course, a part of memory that we can't. And much of our, of our behavior, what we do on a daily basis, is a part of memory that we, don't, we can't talk about. We can't verbalize it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the way that our bodies react to the environment. And it doesn't need to be in conscious awareness, as we would say, right? So there's a, a significant portion of the habits that we have, of the way that we respond to things naturally and that have been uh, conditioned in the non-operant way. To thank everybody. <laughs> I don't know, non-operant. Non -oper I, I tried to work it in counts. for you. I tried to work it in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big part of, of how we act every single day. We go through a lot of the day in um, a series of what we like to call behavioral chains, where every step in the chain sets up the next step of the chain. It's really interesting kind of how when you teach these and go through the, the learning process that the cue for the next step in the chain also is the reinforcer for the previous step in the chain. And if you disrupt any one of those, the chain breaks down. And that's a really pretty interesting way to think about how we go through our days. It's a lot of chains that we don't have to think about. Like the example we give all the time, driving a car. Yeah. It's so automatic, you don't have to think about it. And if you did have to think about it every time, you'd probably be in a little bit of trouble. So there's that aspect of memory and there's what we can, there's what we can talk about. I was, kind of, I was thinking of, of a portion of memory that is verbal. Um, also, people's experience of each one of us individually is different than our own conceptualization of ourself, right? Because our, so much of what we experience is not verbalized. And so our memories, like, we aren't even, they're not in our, in our awareness, but somebody else will remember it differently than the way that we will remember our, their experience of us. So it's pretty interesting when you start breaking those things down. Um, and certainly I think of a, I've got to find the reference for this and, and probably give it to you. Um, there was a really cool, I thought a cool study done, it was like 78 or so, um, where the, the, the researchers um, asked people what the causes of their own behavior were. 
and they ended up with, I'm forgetting what the methodology was, so we would have to reread it, but they, what they came up with is, is what determined what somebody said about what the cause of their behavior was, was number one, what they could notice, what they were actually able to notice in the environment, whether that really caused what happened or not was kind of unrelated, but if they noticed it, they could report it. Um, and the number one reason was really what they thought the other person would find a plausible cause. Hmm what somebody else would believe as that's reasonable why that why you would have done that and so when i think about um when i'm sitting down talking to somebody and we always ask i seem to ask these questions as as clinicians and therapists is, so what you know what happened and, and you know why did you do, why did you do that or what what happened to cause that and we're listening to people's reports about that i think about that study a lot and and think about what information am i getting I'm getting information about what they notice and I'm getting information about what that person thinks that I will find a plausible cause. Mm -hmm. and it helps me to connect with them a little bit better. It helps me to understand kind of where, where they're coming from, so to speak, um, rather than thinking of it as, well, that was a stupid cause or, I don't, or you know, like, or like kind of passing some, some kind of evaluation on the actual reason that they gave me. It just helps me to understand their experience a little bit better. Yeah. And, and it, I, I use this example sometimes in my training is that if, if you think about us evolutionarily and why we hold on to some of these memories or, or learning and conditioning, this is why that question uh, became very fascinating. I, I, your answer was brilliant, but it's like, I, I think about us like back on the savannas of Africa as our brain sort of forming into this, this, this brain we currently have uh, for more or less in modern times. And you see the bush rumble and a saber-toothed tiger jumps out and eats your Uncle Bob. Obviously traumatic for everybody, especially Uncle Bob. Um, but all of a sudden you've got this traumatic memory and you go back and I think the great thing about us as communicators, we could go back to the campfire and share our trauma, which again, we try kind of not to do that in modern day of, of, of sharing our trauma with other people, but, but the story then has a powerful experience. So everybody that's heard the story about the demise of Uncle Bob, every time we see a bush shake, we're gonna run the opposite direction. And how good that was for us in some ways, historically, um, that, that we'd see that danger. And if somebody just looked from an outside perspective is, you know, the wind blew, why are all these people running away from a bush, right? And, and yet, just it's better as I have one of my favorite neurobiology neurobi uh, statements, it's, it's better run, uh, run away from a stick thinking it was a snake then pick up a snake thinking it was a stick. And so, you know, there, there's all these historical lessons. Now, obviously, you put those folks in, in a modern society where they got to go to work every day, they got to go to school, and, and that re-traumatization experience because goes from life-saving uh, to still potentially life-saving, but it can also have detrimental effects as well. And that's where you talk so much about learning and and even though we don't often think about trauma as a learning experience, historically, I think it, it, it was um, and taught us a lot of really important lessons about surviving as a species, a family, and a tribe. Um, and, and now that, again, has some long-term detrimental consequences. So it's, you would never want to take the Uncle Bob thing out of our, our ancestors' brain because, you know, again, it could save their lives and yet you know, you don't want a kid to think every adult in a school is out to abuse and hurt them. So it's this interesting, even just our modern society puts our brains in a very different position. Um, Jerry, any thoughts on this? I remember you talked about, you taught me early on with trauma about, just imagine there's a tiger in the classroom with these kids. And that helped me uh, explain a lot of behaviors that I saw. I got a, if, if, if you don't mind me interrupting, I have a question for you, Jerry, that you said something that's really interesting to me and I've found it interesting for a lot of years that you and I have been talking. And it was when you said that every time we recall a memory, we change it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that because I've been really fascinated by that and I've heard you say it a few times and the process of that I think is just fascinating. So if you wouldn't mind. So, when we store memories, we don't actually store a videotape of what actually happened, right? Based on my 
current developmental age and my capacity, my cognitive capacity to do it, to understand, I store that information. And when I recall that, I recall it not from in the context that I was in, but in my current context. So now when this memory comes up, it also includes my current ability to understand things differently, it, my current relational experience, my current capabilities. My, so that same memory gets changed based on the current context in which I'm remembering it. And so when we look back on our past is we are actually continued to, the past is continuing to be modified by our developmental experiences, mm -hmm. right? Which is how we create narratives and our narratives change over time. How we are in therapy asking people to go back and look at experiences they had from their developmental age now instead of re-experiencing it from they did as when they're six or seven or when they were powerless and helpless, now they're capable. So that this capacity of us to actually alter our memory is very important because oftentimes we confuse our memory of something with what actually happens. And it's really not what actually happened and it doesn't matter what actually happened, but that memory is going to, in some ways, organize my biological response, not just to behavior change, but to memory states. Right, so if I can alter that memory <clears throat> by being in the context of somebody who's there to listen to me, somebody who's to hold me um, emotionally, somebody who's there to validate me, and I'm able to kind of bring this memory up and tolerate the internal sensations and move towards the experience as opposed to away from it, my perception of that memory changes. So trauma work is really about altering some of those experiences in the current so that when we move, we hopefully build in increased capacity to be able to bring up that memory and have a different experience with that memory as we did in the past. I think that's such a great example to tie it back to even how each area, if we do the kind of the triune brain model, right, how each one of those thirds essentially can impact the other one. That's such a great example of that that bringing, um, uh, recalling a memory and talking about a memory in a new state and with new information available in the cortex can change things that happen in the limbic system and, and the brain stem and has an impact on how we feel even when we engage with that memory again and have a completely different emotional experience when we engage with that memory. Right. That fascinating. So if we think about that, right, think about how a, ch a child who's developmentally really only capable of processing and making meaning of sense based on the developmental ability is being in some ways their memory is being created not just by what they're experiencing but by what people are telling them about what experience right so if i'm a child and i'm being told this is happening to you because you like it. Or this is happening to you because you're bad and the reason we're all fighting is it's your fault. Is that context is shaping that memory and then it's shaping my perception of myself in the world. And unless in some ways I revisit that memory later on, and sometimes those memories are not stored in what you call declarative memories. They're stored in really mental models and padded behavioral ways of responding to the world. And so people almost put us in a trance when we're young by the things they tell us, both positive and negative, mm -hmm. that form and shape these memories. So in a way, they have been changing memories forever. A long time. Right. <laughs> Yeah, when you think that, Matt, going back to your central question is like, should we change memories or not? Now I think, yeah, maybe we should. We do it all the time anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, it is kind of and I, you know, I'm, I'm never really scared of too many technologies because what I've learned now that I'm old is that 
technologies like AI, for example, you know, you can watch the Terminator movies and get all freaked out about AI. But AI also makes the video games that I play against the computer so much more engaging than the Atari was, right? I remember the game Pitfall, which was like a really advanced game at the time. You just had to jump at the right time. Now I can play a game like, uh, you know, civilizations where, you know, I've got AI running five or six different historical civilizations. And unfortunately, they usually beat me, which kind of ticks me off about AI. But, you know, so we see this gradual. And I think, Kurt, to your point is like, could you, if you think about someone doing like an EMDR therapy or, or some kind of therapy where we gradually work with a memory to sort of take away the, the negative context to it, could technology, sort of like you can think about psychotropic medications kind of in a similar way, help speed up that process? So there's still a healing process that goes on, but we can support the biology and speed up that, that healing process. And that's where I sort of hope to see this, this could go and have a lot of benefits. So it's not necessarily something new, it's just a more effective way to support the treatments we have. If, if we were having this podcast, which obviously we didn't have the technology to do a hundred years ago, and you talk to like William James and some of those folks back in the day during the founding years of psychology, and they said, you know, part of psychology is going to be you're going to follow someone's finger or tap on their legs, and that's going to release uh, some of the power behind these traumatic memories. They'd probably call you crazy. Um, and now that's become kind of standard practice. Uh, hey, you're going to do this weird looking pose from India and recall traumatic memories and it's going to help in the healing process. Maybe William James, who's my, my hero in psychology, would say, yeah, I, I already thought about that. But uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, a lot of others would think you were crazy and probably put you in the, the hospital just for saying it. Well, to counteract that a little, Matt, is I wonder if people in other cultures knew long before us yeah. that pattern by, by, by stimulation actually is healing to our systems and that they created rituals and practices that were not scientific, so we didn't include them, but really we're not really discovering these things, we're remembering these things, right? And so we're, as you talked, you opened the show with and saying now all of a sudden, yeah. you know, acupuncture is now evidence-based when it's been used for hundreds of thousands of years to kind of look at that. So, you know, I, I think that we have to kind of, um, kind of find, really understand that much of what we're rediscovering, we could find in other cultures that they knew long before we, we, have given it an evidence based label. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to, I, I, you mentioned something and I think it's very important. And I didn't want to skip over that. And that was that many years ago when I ran a treatment center, before we put children on a medication, we had to actually send them to the hospital to get tests. And they actually had to do that in the hospital. We couldn't do that in the treatment centers. And then, because it was so helpful, we moved it and made it easier and easier and easier for us to administer medications to people, to, especially to children. The kind of right, why their own biology is being calibrated and these medications are going in and we have very little idea of how it's gonna impact the long-term developmental trajectory of them, right? So we started doing this on adults medication and then we said, whoa, it's really working. Why don't we try it on adolescents? And then we did it on kids, And right? And if we went back, would we be addressing that in a different way? Would we be thinking about the decision to give kids medications? Not that it's always bad, but how easy it would be to do this. And I think it's the same way as you present this new technology. It's not that it's bad or it's good, but what do we have to be thinking about to kind of implement it in the most effective way to help the most without it becoming really too easy to manipulate memories? 
and too easy because in some ways, there's things about AI that do scare me. As you know, when I was younger, I can remember almost everybody's telephone number. I don't remember anybody's telephone number anymore, right? Because it's on my speed dial. I have a hard enough time remembering my own. Now, maybe, <laughs> maybe we don't need that function anymore because it's there. And now I have new brain power to focus on something else. But I'm not sure we thought clearly about that that's something we want to give up. And so if we want to give up the capacity to change our own memories and to be able to cope with experience and to do it, do we really want to tr truly go down a road where somebody says, okay, I can go in your head and change your memories? Those are the questions I think we have to ask ourselves. And yet there are times where it would probably be a pretty neat thing to do for somebody who actually can't function because of what they're remembering day in and day out. Yeah. So I, I think it's a really interesting issue you raised today. Um, but like most of the issues you raised today, um, I could really fall on both sides of this. Um, and what it really, it kind of warrants some deep conversation about the ethics mm -hmm. of where we're going as a field. And, um, What's the impact on, especially on our young? Yeah. Well, let, let me ask a kind of a, a question. I know we're running out of time, but I, I think it's an important twist on this question. I think whereas nanobots and these scanning technologies are, are probably more likely two decades out or more, if, if they ever exist, because the brain's incredibly complex and pulling this off without creating permanent, you know, negative brain injuries is, is really difficult. But I think, and one of you may know more about the current state of this, I do believe we have a pharmaceutical ways. Let's say someone comes in the emergency room after a, uh, a severely traumatic event um, to basically keep that memory from entering long-term memory. And I, I've, I've heard about this research, but I, I think we're closer to there um, with kind of eliminating the formation of, of long-term memories if, if that medication is given close enough. And I wonder if, if that would change, what, kind of what you think of that? Because I do think that that's something that I've heard of maybe being tried out. I haven't kept uh, great tabs on that research, but I, but I think it's something uh, that, that we can do things like just a heavy night of drinking and your memories um, are maybe a little different than your designated driver's memories of the night. Um, if if I, I know Kurt Jerry's been there, I've never had that heavy night of drinking before. But uh, you know, you don't you know. that's the problem. <laughs> I remember you. Don't remember. We will never mention the last day I worked with Jerry. It was not pleasant. Uh, at least the next morning, I had fun that night. Uh, weird memories. Let's put it that way. But uh, I wonder if if that is any different for you guys? Like, like if we could use a substance to keep that memory from going into long-term memory, what, what are your thoughts about uh, uh, that? Probably a science that if it's not here right now, it's, it, we've got a lot of components of it at least. You want to answer that or you want me to answer that? Kurt? Boy, I mean, I, I don't know that the answer is much different than what we've talked about so far, right? There could be some very good parts of that and there could be some very bad parts of that. And so it, whether it's altering memories, I mean, it's still altering a memory, essentially, right? changing its conversion from short term to long term. Um, I mean, one of the things that can do that often as probably as, as well as a, as a drug is uh, having a caring person around when you go through something that's difficult, right? That can be a great way to change a memory about something that you went through that's difficult and that doesn't require any pharmacology at all. Uh, even though it has a, a lot of pharmacological benefits and, and a lot of physiological benefits. So, nor, nor would we ever judge that as a, a and negative never say thing that, either, right, would That would be a very positive thing. There would be no ethical dilemma about that. Yeah. And it may have very similar effects. So uh, two, two, two uh, thoughts about that. One is there's some research that um, when they're doing exposure therapies, 
if somebody takes something like uh, prednisone, which is a steroid that suppresses the cortisol mm -hmm. in, your, in your body, your immune system, they're, be they're a better able to benefit from and the exposure therapy to kind of look at that, right? So they um, manipulate the biology in order to kind of get to that. But I think it's an interesting thing. Bruce McEwen does some work on looking at the impact of stress, prolonged stress on the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And when we are exposed to prolonged stress on the hippocampus, the hippocampus shrinks. And one of the theories about that is, is it shrinks as a way of protecting itself. And when we remove the stress or readjust the cortisol levels, the hippocampus can actually repair itself where prefrontal cortex doesn't have that. Hmm. And so when we talk about manipulating um, memories, maybe the body has a way to manipulate memories as well when things get too great. And it shuts down things, and then it opens up things as, as well to kind of look at that. So we see as everything has a biochemical component of it. Some of it's natural. Some of it's natural, but it's manipulated. And some of it is not natural at all, mm -hmm. right, to kind of looking at those things. So I think that the gist of our conversation here today, the kind of takeaway is, is that whenever you're interacting with somebody, you have an opportunity to alter their memory. And that how you listen to them, how you respond to them, how you attend to them, how you hold their experience could actually begin to alter their memory so that when they re-experience coming to your facility, coming to your agency, coming, the next time it may feel very different, right? So that something got changed to kind of looking at that. So memory alteration is with us all the time. The second thing is we have our own memories. And so when we use things like mindfulness or Tai Chi or whatever to regulate our states as we begin to approach whatever we need or engage in pattern repetitive rhythmic relational rewarding activities and we change the state and then we engage in something we have the ability to impact our own so mm -hmm. kind of piggybacking on what uh, Kurt said is that the mind could change our biology the brain can change our biology and relationships can change and all of them can change our memories mm -hmm. so as we think about that and we think about the future Really, tomorrow is the future, and that we have an opportunity to, and hopefully, we've changed your memory about memories today. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what a great note to end on. Uh, well, well, I want to thank you both. Uh, I knew this would be a fascinating conversation. I was like, I, you know, maybe they'll just think I'm weird eventually, but, but oh, it's been a no, we still, we still think hours. You didn't uh, change my memory of that. No, I still, I still remember <laughs> that very clearly. <laughs> but, but this, this was really, I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little thing and a little thought that I'm seeing pop up. But I think again, it shows the complexity of the work that we're trying to do. It's not just as simple as, boy, if we grab that memory and took it out, the person's life would be uh, overnight just totally different. And I think that it's. It's a real powerful thing. And, and I also just want to put, um, and I, I love to say these next words, we went in a little bit more deeper detail uh, than he did. But again, if you haven't listened to Matthew Gladwell's, or Malcolm Gladwell's, excuse me, third season of his Revisionist History podcast, it's all on memory. And, and it's really great um, if you haven't heard it. So may, maybe Ma uh, Malcolm will plug our podcast at some point, but I I definitely, uh, he, he uh, really brings this to life with some real life examples and uh, around Brian Williams and uh, a lot of other memory recalls that uh, changed over time. And right. There's only six degrees of separation. So somebody on our podcast knows somebody who knows Malcolm. So maybe they'll let him know to get on our podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. He's got connections to all the sponsors, right? Like Blue Apron, like 
I don't even want the money. I just want free meals. I like (laughs) something along the way for season two. So uh, great show, guys. Thanks so much. Again, we'll put the resources. uh, We got some discussion questions um, at traumainformlens.org. Um, I'll put the link to, to Gladwell's uh, podcast as well. Um, next week, I want to I want to explore. We're, we're kind of got two uh, uh, podcasts left in our first year, uh, so we we've got episode uh, fifty and fifty one uh, to go. Uh, f- uh, for fifty one, I've got a good friend, and I know Jerry knows her as well, uh, to talk about spirituality. Next week, I'd like to sort of prep that with the concept of hope. Um, we talk about hope a lot. We talked about the growth mindset recently, um, but I think it's a topic uh, worth a discussion. So we'll, we'll tackle the concept of hope and trauma recovery next week. I think it's a great one to lead into, to, I, I'm sure what will be a fun uh, conversation on spirituality as well. So thank you again for listening as always. Um, and again, you can find all the resources and everything at traumainformedlens.org. Have a great week. Thank you.